All right, I don't see any more in the waiting room. We'll go ahead and get this started this evening. Uh, welcome everybody. I'm Jeff Limpcooler, one of the Beef Extension Specialists and uh, good to see all of you here again this evening. Uh, tonight we've got a special treat for you where we've got two speakers that are gonna be joining us this evening uh, to visit with you a little bit about some of the current market situations. Uh, first this evening, we're going to hear from Dr. Greg Renfro and then after uh, Dr. Renfro, Dr. Kenny Burdine will uh, share a little bit on the market outlooks. Um, without uh, further ado, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Renfro. Dr. Renfro is our extension meat specialist. He's uh, well recognized across the uh, region and the country for his contributions uh, in the meat science area. In 2017, he was the uh, Whitaker Award for Excellence in Extension as some of you might see in the chat as well. Dr. Renfro just recently was uh, named the 2020 American Meat Science Association Extension Industry Award recipient. Congratulations, Dr. Renfro you, on sir. that accomplishment. That was just yesterday, the word travels fast. Yes, it does. So uh, again, we want to uh, say uh, congratulations on uh, that award as well. And we also uh, uh, have, a other awards that he received, he was the Young Animal Science Leader and in the ex Outstanding Extension Award winner for the Midwest uh, Division of the American Association of Animal Scientists. He received the 2011 Achievement Award from uh, American Meat Science Association, as well as many other awards. So uh, congratulations on, on those awards. And he has certainly been a great contributor to our program. Uh, he has done a couple of YouTube interviews with me that have been well received. The first one, uh, I think in a matter of a few weeks, we had 400 views, uh, giving basically updates on plant openings and closures. And uh, we did one last Friday and, and Greg, I think it's already up over 200 views as of oh, right wow. now. Wow. So without any further ado, it's my pleasure to turn the program this evening over to Dr. Greg Renfro. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Lim Cooler. You forgot I got third place in the Tracks for Packs 5K in 2017 as well. Ah, there we go. I knew I would miss those. <laughs> so, okay, I hope everybody can see my screen. Is that what um, folks can see now? I guess so. Gotcha, Greg. All right, good. Um, yeah, just kind of uh, what I thought I would do this evening is. Uh, Kind of give you an overview of what's uh, going on in the industry from the from the big plants all the way down to the retail side and give a little bit of uh, lip service to what's going on or what may happen as we start to reopen restaurants and so on uh, what that's going to do the meat supply as well um, i will say one thing i'm here in the garrigus building because i got better wi-fi here uh eight o'clock at night in the garrigus building it is creepy they have not changed light bulbs since we left at spring break and it is it's really kind of weird here <laughs> like i said looking at what's going on in the industry right now um um is this slide moving at all or it's a gif slide it doesn't seem like it's moving on my end but this is i wish you could see this uh i, I downloaded it because i thought it was really cool because it tracks what happened from the middle of March to what's happened last week as far as the plants go. And we started to see more and more plants that uh, uh, in the blue test positive, have positive tests for COVID. And then we've seen those that are uh, that closed and reopened. The good thing is now, now this is April 2nd, so it doesn't look nearly as bad, but the one from the last update, because this was supposed to be kind of one of those cool animation things that make everybody excited and ooh and ah. But we, we have a lot of blue, uh, balloons there, uh, a lot of green balloons, but not very many uh, red balloons on that because uh, we're getting most of our meat processors back up and running. Uh, the challenge of it is, as you see in the picture there, that's very typical of what the uh, meat industry pre-COVID-19 looked like as far as uh, shoulder to shoulder, uh, elbow to elbow, assembly line type processing. And what I read today, uh, in some of the reports that they are opening back up. They're about 15% less workforce than what they normally have. Uh, the part of the issues that is, is they're allowing workers that are in that at-risk group 
to not come back to work but still keep their pay or if they are working in that home they have a person who's in that at, at risk group as well so you have some of those in that 15 percent uh, uh, category as well uh, now that we've got the plants back open we've gone through the deep cleaning and so on we're starting to see uh, the workers are getting more acclimated to the new normal I, and i apologize for using that uh, mainly because the two words that we keep hearing all the time are social distancing and the new normal. I apologize for that. But, uh, but they are getting used to that. And so as they get used to it, they get a little bit quicker. And I think uh, Dr. Burdine is going to hit on some of that as some positive news as they're getting used to that. Now, what I thought was interesting in some of the reports that I've read is they've spent so much time looking on what they need to do to make sure the workers are safe and healthy as far as health screenings and taking temperatures and so on. Now they're starting to look at what the workers are doing outside of the plant. And I don't necessarily mean getting into their, uh, into their personal lives, but something as simple as a lot of the plant workers carpool. And so when you start thinking about workers carpooling in and others that work, live in, you know, large families that adds an extra layer of concern in there so they're starting to work through that stuff as well i have noticed that as as we as we start to narrow down into the retail segment of this uh, i did read today that a few of our companies realizing that we are getting into a supply issue uh, with meat at the retail level they're starting to shift product that was intended for export and they're trying to, starting to go more towards domestic production so they are uh, acknowledging that there is a some supply uh, worries out there and they're starting to shift those export uh, materials to the domestic uh, materials as well kind of narrowing down a little bit closer in in the, it was happening here at home uh, pretty much the same as we've been talking about all along dr. Lemcooler was talking about some of these updates we do on Friday mornings from my basement and and his home office uh, still seeing what's going on out there. Nothing's really changed. We're seeing some of these these meat processors within the state that are custom. So these are the individuals. They're not USDA inspected. They're just processing an animal for a farmer or his own home use. Uh, they're they're book solid. They're they're going uh, as much as they can. Even those that are both USDA and custom, they're seeing not only their custom. Uh, uh, business go uh, increase dramatically, but they're also seeing their USDA uh, reservations increase as well. I talked with one processor uh, two weeks ago. He said, I've got 10 spots left for the year. Talked to him a few days later. He says, I'm taking bookings for January. And then I, I talked to him just, just late last week, I think it was Thursday. He said, I'm already booking animals for March. And so this is, this is a challenge. Uh, USDA uh, plants that have a retail, uh, we have a few of those in the, uh, in the state as well. They have been relying on the retail and they've kind of backed off on their custom and the USDA slaughters because they're, they're pretty scared that they're gonna get a virus in there and they're gonna have a cooler full of meat and it's gonna run through the plant and they're gonna be in trouble that way. But now that I, I'd like to say we're on the downward uh, slide of this pandemic. Um, they are starting to increase things uh, more. I was in one of those uh, uh, processor retailers yesterday, and I'm going to tell you, folks, all they were doing was selling meat, and it was wall to wall, bumper to bumper in there. And one of them told me that, and I should say one of them, several have told me that labor remains a huge issue for them. Um, some of them have. have gotten special grants where they can give bonuses to their employees to keep them there. I don't want this to turn political by any stretch of the means, but there are certain individuals that can make more money on unemployment than they can working. And that's, that creates a huge issue for these guys as well. I will say one thing, I'm pretty proud of what, what has happened in Frankfurt, that this has got the attention of the commissioner of ag's office it has got the attention of GOAP, KCARD, and all those programs out of Frankfurt. Um, and they are just now rolling out the program that was approved last week to look at and address increasing processing within the Commonwealth. Uh, what can we do to not only help increase production of our current processors, 
Um, my email and phone has been ringing off the hook of people wanting to start their own meat processing business. I will say that the only, um, the only two states that border us that I have not gotten phone calls from is, is Illinois and Missouri. Every other state that borders us, I've had phone calls from farmers looking for somebody in Kentucky to process their animals because they can't find it in their, their own state as well. So that has got on the radar screen of the, uh, of, uh, the folks in Frankfurt and they have rolled out some programs to address that as well. And so, uh, you know, extension agents, uh, just FYI, cause, uh, they're really going to start pushing it, that and rolling that stuff out soon. So, so it is, it is a challenge, uh, but we're hopefully, uh, going to help make it better here in the next uh, few months. Um, drilling down even closer, retail sales. Uh, I don't think anybody has not noticed that meat has gone up in price in the grocery store. It doesn't matter if it's beef, pork, chicken, whatnot, it has gone up in price. Uh, just a few statistics here. Uh, the first three months of the year, January, February, March, the average per price, uh, uh, per price, price per pound, let me get that out there. The average price per pound for beef was five ninety four. Ending in April it was six forty four. That is a huge increase. We haven't seen an increase like that in a month's time ever. And so, if you think about what's going to happen in May, I yeah, I can't imagine it going down. Uh, we have seen most of our grocery store chains, and I would even imagine the independent. Uh, Grocers change as well are starting to put limits on products that you can buy. Uh, this is this is a good thing. Uh, granted, it's a it's a frustrating thing when you go in there and you can only buy two or three pieces or packages of meat. It's a little frustrating. But when we looked at some of the bare shelves, the, the items that we had in bare shelves uh, earlier uh, during this pandemic, we were looking at distribution issues, not necessarily the supply issue, but distribution issues. Now we're kind of getting into some scary supply issues uh, with me. I am still maintaining that we don't panic buy. I've gotten a lot of emails and text messages from folks out there saying, you, you said don't panic buy, and I said, I'm still saying that. Uh, but as you can see, here's week ending uh, May 10th. So we're talking Mother's Day week, Mother's Day weekend, 40% increase in, in meat sales. Uh, versus last year, if you put those two weeks together, the week before uh, Mother's Day weekend, uh, over 50% increase compared to last year's sales. This marks nine straight weeks we have seen a double digit increase in sales compared to those weeks of last year in meat sales together. Beef had the biggest share there. Let me go page up there. Now this is, for those of you who didn't realize, this is the picture I was talking about with the uh, uh, the meat industry with, you know, that kind of assembly line, shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow type uh, processing right there, which has changed. Now we've got social distancing, we've got plexiglass in between them and so on and so forth, staggered um, staggered uh, shift times and so on. But, but yeah, yeah, nine straight weeks of double digit gains in sales. Uh, beef obviously has the biggest one. If you, when you look at the other commodities there, uh, beef has, is still reigning king in the, in the meat case. Uh, what I thought was interesting, I realize we're talking about beef tonight, but uh, uh, I found it fascinating in my grocery stores. I've seen uh, times when the meat case is plentiful. I've seen times when the meat case is spotty. I seems like every time I go to around the corner, frozen chicken is sold out, but we still have plenty of fresh chicken. So it's, I don't know if people forgot we can buy fresh chicken or not but it's just weird how those buying habits are, are happening out there um i took a couple of different studies on this and and um and thought i would put them together in one slide one talked about what's the hot commodity out there in the meat case and it's ground beef uh part of that is we are now consuming more meals at home uh, you know, lunch out is not happening anymore. People are not going out. Uh, that's why we have things like Takeout Tuesday, which kind of coincides with Taco Tuesday, I guess. But uh, part of the reason why we're seeing such an increase in ground beef sales is consumers are telling us, I can grill a steak, I can make ground beef, but I don't know what to do with that big chunk that they call a roast. And so 
we're starting to see folks, you know, as they return to the kitchen, they're starting to realize their limits on cooking. The other one that doesn't surprise me is hot dogs, uh, being a hot sales item. We see that in the summertime, uh, regardless of a pandemic or not. This is a typical product that kids eat. And so you see that all the time with, uh, uh, in the summertime, it just seems like we're seeing it earlier because of folks being uh, at home with their kids. Another uh, study I read today, uh, an article, um, this is kind of interesting. 25% of the consumers out there are nervous about buying meat. And what this relates to is we have been telling folks that you can't, it's very unlikely that you're going to contract COVID-19 from by consuming a piece of meat that someone who has COVID-19 has handled. That message that we have been saying at our level here has not really been resonating very well with the, the with the media so it can get out into the uh, to the uh, the public there and that's what that 25 percent is they're nervous about consuming it because they're seeing in the news all these meat plants are closing due to illness and that's what they're concerned about the next bullet relates back to what we're talking about with this increase in sales 53 percent of our consumers out there have been stockpiling, are stockpiling currently, and are going to continue to stockpile until we get through this. Uh, these are the ones that one retailer told me that he sees people loading up, going through the checkout line, putting it in a car, coming back in, and even with the limits, they're, they're able to get by that as well. 16% of the population tend to have a one to two day supply of meat in the freezer. That's me and my family, to be brutally honest with you. 27% have a week's work, 26 have two weeks, 25% are, have two weeks or more than two weeks in there uh, in the freezer as far as meat supply. What I thought was really, really interesting is baby boomers are the least likely to stockpile. And it tends to be the millennial generation that's driving this stockpiling of meat, which I thought that was, was really interesting. Um, what's going to happen with restaurants? Um, this is... This is a huge issue as more states, their economies come back online and they start opening up restaurants. What's going to happen when we start doing this in-service dining? We've been doing the curbside pickup and the takeouts and so on and so forth. But are folks, the big question, are folks going to willing to go back into the, into the dining halls, even though we are at third uh, capacity? Um, are they going to go, are they going to return? What's that going to do to the meat supply if they do return? All right. Because what is, what has helped the retail industry and I've had a few meat buyers from, from large grocery store chains tell me this is they were able to purchase items that were intended for, uh, for food service, repackage those, recut those and put them in the meat cases, which helped kind of hold this, uh, supply chain up a little bit more than, than in the past. But now we're seeing more of our major processors are going to start to focus on food service as well. Um, something that I, I observed today that I thought was extremely interesting. Um, these are discussions that we are having on campus right now. Uh, what does the fall 2020 semester going to look like? You know, what is the teaching going to look like? Well, they've they've now put together these work groups and they've asked me to be a part of uh, the dining work group. And I tell you, that's a huge, huge issue. And we started talking about that today in a zoom meeting is we've got two dining halls. Uh, one holds 800 people. The other one holds 1100 people. And now you're only at a third capacity. And so you're still, you're talking about maybe feeding 450 people at lunchtime in a dining hall, but you still have, three or 4,000 kids that need to eat lunch and get to their next class. You know, how do we do that? How do we, you know, most of these dining halls are buffet style, you know, grabbing, grabbing tongs and spoons and ladles and things like that. It's an issue, just something we're, we're, we were talking about today. And it, what I thought was interesting was in each of these work groups, there's a student and that student said she is not comfortable eating in an establishment like this where we're still doing this pandemic. Another individual from the hospital said the same thing. I was the only one who said I was okay with it. 
but just kind of something to think about. I don't know the answer to this question, what's going to happen when we go back to in-restaurant dining. I looked for opinions online, didn't really see any I thought that was worth passing on, but just something to think about there. And with that, even though I've got asked questions, I think we're going to ask questions at the end, and I will stop sharing and let Dr. Burdine take over. Thank you, Dr. Renfro. And just as a reminder, um, please feel free to put any questions in the chat box and uh, my colleagues and I will monitor the chat box for questions for our speakers at the end this evening. Um, as we go through any, any questions you have, um, be sure and put those in there and you can address those uh, to everyone so that they can see those questions. Uh, now it's my pleasure, uh, Dr. Renfro, thank you very much for that informative uh, discussion and we'll get back to you here uh, in a bit. But uh, those of you that uh, have been following the, the Friday updates that we've done uh, about every two weeks um, have probably seen a little bit of that. But also I think it's important that um, we recognize that there is change and, and it seems as Dr. Renfro mentioned that change seems to happen nearly every day uh, with plants coming online or, or maybe uh, closing or, or suspending operations for cleanup for a period of time. So there's a lot of volatility right now in that. So we would encourage you to continue to follow that and, and watch how that pans out over or plays out over time. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Kenny Burdine. Dr. Burdine is no stranger to many of you as well. Uh, he also is a well-recognized and respected uh, colleague of ours in 2018. He received the Ken uh, Friedman Outstanding Faculty Advisor Award. Uh, many of you may not know this, but he also does teach uh, some classes as well and uh, is dedicated to his students and also advises uh, some of the undergrad students to help them get their course pathways and, and get graduated from UK. He was also the recipient of the Gary Lacefield Alfalfa Public Service Award in 2016. Um, as well as uh, Kenny received the Public uh, Farm Public Relations Award from Kentucky Farm Bureau and Outstanding Extension Specialist Award from Kentucky Association of State Extension Professionals. So Dr. Burdine, again, you've tallied up some nice recognition, but uh, we all know you well enough to know that it's well-deserved and we appreciate you joining us this evening to give us an update on what the market situation is on the beef side and, and where we might be going here in the next month or so. Well, thanks, Jeff. I sure appreciate it. Um, I will fire up here and we'll, we'll get rolling. Jump in and stop me if you have anything that I need to clarify or something didn't look right. Let, let me know. And really enjoyed hearing what Dr. Renfro had to say. That was great. I learned a lot. I look forward to talking with him some after the new questions and so forth. So, Anyway, I'm really going to just do three things. Um, and in fact, I called an audible this afternoon and tweak things a little bit. Um, I'm going to start by talking about kind of why the market's doing what they're doing and what we've seen. And then I want to share a few of my thoughts on just management implications because I get a lot of questions about, you know, what do I do given this and, and what makes sense and kind of give my two cents worth there. And then the piece that I added um, this afternoon, actually about lunchtime, um, USDA released the details for the coronavirus food assistance program. So that's a hot topic. I'm going to kind of mention that to, at the end there and talk about kind of what we do know now because we have a lot more clarity about how some of those payments are going to work. Um, really quickly, just kind of reviewing where we've been market-wise, there's been three phases of this. And in a lot of ways, the phases have gotten worse as they've gone through. So you know, your February impact really was more about exports and that was going to impact beef exports from the United States and particularly the Asian markets. And then we really got hit really hard in March when the, when the impact was all about domestic demand. And, you know, we had so much decreased activity, so many closings, starting to hear a lot of layoffs, consumers doing less. You know, we, we lost a huge chunk of our market, which is the food service market that got shifted towards home. Dr. Renfro mentioned that. That was kind of the demand impact. And then the April and May impact um, really, and it's just started improving about the last two weeks has been the supply chain disruption. So the way I guess I explain it to folks is we're dealing with a demand shock, a significant demand shock, and at the same time a processing bottleneck. And, and those two things hitting us at the same time have been quite a one-two punch. The other thing that's kind of been lost in this, I think, is that um, beef production levels, and really production levels across the board with all meats, and they're all related price-wise, we're actually going to be pretty high in the first half of 2020. 
So in some ways it couldn't have hit us at a worse time in the sense that we actually were gonna have quite a bit of beef to work through anyway. Um, we're gonna start right off the bat and just talk about cattle slaughter. Now, before I talk a lot about where we've been, I wanna really quickly just point out what we did there in March. And I think that has gotten a little bit less attention than it should have, but we really saw some sizable um, processing numbers in March. And I think it's important to note that, note that because I think we saw that show up somewhat in beef cold storage. Ordinarily, if you kind of look at the dotted line, which is last year, the red line, which would be the five years prior to last year, we typically draw down beef in cold storage from January into the spring. Notice we saw an increase January, February, and March, and that's unusual. And I think that part of that was that these processors were trying to get ahead of what they thought might be some labor issues were going to occur, and then they certainly did. Back of the napkin, roughly an economist's math, if I just kind of look at per capita beef consumption in the U.S. and look at how big a number that was for that Martin's cold storage report, we had, just, just looking at pounds now, I'm not talking about quantities of different types, but just looking at pounds, we probably had something like nine to ten days of beef consumption sitting, sitting in cold storage. I think it's kind of worth mentioning as we think about supply issues. Um, up until, well, so about three weeks ago, total cattle slaughter was running about 35% below year ago levels and, and it was down for quite a while. That was significant enough. There was no way that was not going to have some impact that was, that was tangible at the retail level and certainly a big impact in terms of cattle prices. Fortunately, the last three weeks, we've seen that move up. Um, and Dr. Rubin did a great job talking about this, but you know, we're so for, for last week, we were running something closer to 25% below year ago levels. And to me, that's one of the key questions that we got to think about here is that, you know, we're, we're not going to move cattle at the same pace that we were in 2019 because of some of the procedures that have been put in place. You know, he talked about temperature checks. He talked about spacing folks out. You've probably seen on TV putting, you know, putting glass dividers and stuff. You know, we're, we're slowing things down because of the situation that we're dealing with. So there's a message for you. The new normal that, that he referenced probably involves a lower, lower capacity level than we like to think about from the cattle side. And that's becoming problematic because we are tending to back some cattle up. Um, the good news though is that fed cattle price really responded to those higher slaughter levels the last few weeks. So we had hit a bottom or a low a few weeks ago, kind of in this 96 cents a pound range. We've taken that up this past week to about $1.12, $1.13. Not much cash cattle traded yet this week, but, but all indications are that we're going to continue to see that move with slaughter levels. And, if, and I always kind of say, if, if the cattle market had a pulse, this fed cattle market is it. So although we don't move many fed cattle in Kentucky, we're very much impacted what we see in the fed cattle market. Those of you that know, know me and have followed what I've written over the years and off the hoof and so forth. I tend not to look at prices week to week very often. I tend to think more monthly because there's some noise week to week. But really the last couple of months, I've tracked things almost exclusively weekly because things have just been moving so rapidly and they have been so volatile up until at least the last few weeks. Um, and gotten to the point where really last week's market wasn't really a good indication of this week. And for that matter, yesterday, not today. The black line there, that's 550 pound uh, medium and large frame number one, two feeder steer. So I'll kind of look at that as that's my wing cap market. And the blue line there, the light blue line, that's an 850 pound ML one, two steer. And I've kind of been watching these for the past couple of months, just kind of as my baseline for what I like to call calves and heavy feeders. Um, I want you to notice a couple things though. Let's talk about calves first. So on a state average basis, that calf right now, is selling for about the same that he was selling for in January. And those of you that know calf markets know that that's not in any way what we typically tend to see. And heavy feeders, even almost a more, more depressing story, he's selling for, you know, 15, 20 cents a pound less than he was selling for in January. And at the same time, understand that, that both of these markets should have moved up from January to now instead of moving downward. Another way to kind of look at this is look at it monthly. Um, I put this together from the data on Friday. So I, I've got three months worth of May in here, but this heavy feeder cattle chart month to month is almost a linear drop from January to April. And then we finally saw a little bit of bounce um, in the first three weeks of May. 
So state average basis at 850 is moving for about a dollar ten. You know, one of the one of the problems is state average prices are, are they're they're just what they are. They're good for average numbers. They're going to understate prices for higher quality groups and value added cattle. So you can add about a dime on that for what larger high quality groups of cattle would sell for. We did have some kind of up around 120 last week for sure. Similar story on calves, except you don't see quite as much drop. But the way I guess that I describe what's happened with the calf market is it's taken out our seasonal price increase that we get in the spring. It's taken out that, that grass run up that we always see kind of in the April, May time period. So this is again, roughly an economist math, but, but as I kind of think about the impact here on our producers, um, with that, with that um, background that these prices tend to increase from January to spring, and we haven't seen that. So you can't look at just the drop, how, you know, what are they now versus what they were in January? I think the real question is, what would they be otherwise? In my opinion, these heavy feeders, you know, so I think 750s and up, probably off 150 to $225 per head. Calves probably off somewhere between $100 and $150 a head. And, and that's kind of been our impact on producers here. Um, I want to talk just briefly about the cull cow market. For most of our cow calf operations, cull cows account for something like 20 or 25% of revenues for those operations, so it's significant. It tends to be somewhat fluid too. Um, Dr. Renfro made a really good point talking about the ground beef market and how our at-home consumption tends to be a bit more ground beef oriented. And in a lot of ways, you would expect the cold cow market to actually benefit somewhat from a market like this. And, and we were definitely seeing that early on. This drop that we saw though, from the end of March, to, I'm sorry, from the end of March through the first week of April, that was driven by that processing bottom. I and mean, it really, the cow market really got hit hard there for about two weeks as we're dealing with some processing disruptions. The good news is though, since then that cold cow market moved up quite a bit what I'm showing you here is the average dress, 80 to 85% boning cow. She was just under 60 cents a pound state average basis last week. Whole lot of good quality calves were, or cows were up in the 60s. A few even grabbed the 70s, higher dresses and things like that. I would say this quickly though, before I leave this topic. Um, and I honestly, this is not historically a bad cold cow market. Dotted line there is, is a, 10 year average from 2010 to 2019. Understand that's biased upward by some really strong prices in 2014 and 15. Red line there's 2019, blue line there's 2020. This is about a typical, typical cull cow market with cull cows somewhere kind of here in the mid 50s for, for an average dress boning cow. So it's not a bad cull cow market relative to everything else that is certainly off a whole lot more than the cull cow market has been. Um, in terms of thinking about uh, the balance for 2020, you know, you, you, I think I can easily make a case that it's our winter backgrounders that hit the hardest. Those folks that had carried cattle through the winter, that had cattle need to be sold this spring, some have sold, some have tried to hold, but they've been hit, I think, the hardest on a per head basis. In terms of summer stocker operators, frankly, it's all about placement time. Um, you know, most of those folks are placing calves on grass sometime in the March, April time period. It's been kind of a start stop kind of spring with some freezes. So I don't exactly know how, how that impacted these placement patterns. But, you know, volatility sometimes creates opportunity for margin operators. And there have been some opportunities for stocker operators to buy some calves at a decent price this spring and put them in a grazing type program. At the same time, the market provided opportunities. Um, the end of last week, the uh, fall feeder cattle futures contracts were in the, you know, we're right around 140. They're about 135 or so when I'm talking to you this evening. But you think about this calf market, they've been in the 140s, even, you know, higher quality groups in the 150s, and a fall board in the 140s, stock operators can make that work. So in some cases, there's been opportunity to place some calves in grazing programs and do, I think, reasonably well if the market holds. Um, what I've generally told people is anytime you get a situation like this where something comes totally out of left field, try to fight the urge to act out of panic. And, you know, don't, don't make decisions based solely on fear. Another I mean, positive way to say that might be don't deviate from your basic marketing plan. So, you know, a lot of these winter backgrounders have said, you know, should I, should I keep these feeders a bit longer? 
well, you know, if, if they can, if the frame can handle it and not get flashy, market supports it, and if you can, if they're gaining efficiently, okay, you know, fine. But the truth of the matter is, I'd probably tell you that whether the market was where it is now or not, right? And it's more about adding weight efficiently than it is trying to guess what the market's going to do. Um, at the same time, I really do continue to be worried about how much cattle are backing up in the system. You know, we've been running slaughter numbers, you know, a few weeks ago, 30 to 40% below year ago levels. Now we're more 25% or so below. If you look at March placements in the end of feed yards, they were down, I uh, forget the number, 20 some percent. Just looked at the uh, expectation for placements when cattle on feed numbers come out on Friday. They're expecting on average a 23% reduction from last year. If you look at Kentucky marketings through stockyards, you know, we, we've been running 20 to 20 to 35% below where we were last year in terms of cattle. So there's no question we're back in the cattle in the system and we're going to eventually have to work through those cattle. Um, another extreme question that I've gotten from folks is, you know, I've got cattle that I back out this winter, uh, you know, I wanted to sell them this spring, you know, should I, rather than sell those cattle, should I retain ownership and send them out west to be placed on feed? And, you know, I'm not, I'm not opposed to retained ownership, but I'm opposed to retained ownership if the only reason to do it is because I want to avoid taking a loss on cattle. Um, you know, there you are taking, you know, there is some risk in doing that. Folks that do well retaining ownership have got good cattle and they know how those cattle do. Um, in reality, in a market like this, you know, if, if you're simply retaining ownership to avoid taking a loss on cattle that you background, I always like to say, you know, in reality, you don't avoid that loss. If cattle are worth what they're worth, you really just roll that loss into another program. So, so again, I, I don't, I have no issue with retaining ownership. Um, so sometimes it works well but only do that if that makes sense for your operation. Don't just do it because I want to speculate essentially on the fed cattle market and hope that it gets better. Um, sometimes it's easy to forget, given what's happened the last few months, that we actually, the person I did, I came into 2020 with some optimism about this cattle market. Um, we had some really good news on the trade front, better access to Japan, USMCA, um, you know, we, you know, better access to China. China, even in the fall, had agreed to start taking U.S. Uh, U.S. poultry, which was going to open up some possibilities in terms of price and have some spillover effects on beef. And the, and the cow herd was actually smaller coming to 2020. So I was expecting a much better 2020 pre-COVID-19. Unfortunately, I think that this fall calf market is going to be about a dime off where it would have been otherwise and something closer to last year's level so you know we, it's been a tough spring i think these spring having herds are them for a pretty tough fall as well but you know I, I give the same basic advice to cow calf operators when they ask the similar kind of questions that backgrounders do um you know be careful about deviating from your basic marketing plan Fall calving operations that wean calves this spring, you know, a lot of those folks weren't wanted to lay sell those calves. And again, that's perfectly fine, you know, if if I can put gain on efficiently. So in general, I advocated that for folks that had pasture and that could grow those calves for a period of time using some inexpensive forage. I did not advocate that for folks that wanted to, you know, put those cattle on feed and grow them on some sort of feeding ration. Reason simply being, if you're feeding calves in the spring on purchase feed, you're really competing with stocker operators. And I just don't think that's a game that many of us can win year in, year out. So by doing that, you're effectively speculating on the calf market. So again, my basic advice is, yeah, it makes sense to do that if, if it would make sense given your, your typical market situation. Don't do it just because you want to avoid taking a loss on the calves. They, they are worth what they're worth. Um, in the same way that sometimes opportunities present themselves in volatile markets like this in terms of calf placements and the stocker programs, the same type of opportunities oftentimes present themselves on the cow calf side. You know, it's markets like this when we're able to develop some of our cheapest breeding stock because our females are worth less than they would be otherwise. We can get good buys sometimes on bred heifers, on cows and things like that. So always think long term. And don't let a single year drive cow-calf management decisions. You know, cows are a multi-year investment. Their profitability is not determined in a single year. A single year is determined over the course of their lifetime. So always think long-term on long-term investments. 
Um, last thing I'll say on the market and then talk a little bit about CFAP, expect a bumpy ride. And, you know, I think, you know, Dr. Renford did a good job talking about the processing side. You know, he talked about what happens when, what happens when restaurants open. But, you know, a lot of activities are starting to pick back up. And I think what happens with cases, what happens with infection, the way consumers react, you know, we don't know exactly how things are going to go as things open back up. And in a lot of ways, I think the next few weeks are critical in determining how much longer we deal with this certainly demand shock, but probably even to some extent this processing bottleneck too. So the next few months are crucial, but the volatility I think is probably going to stay in place. Um, last thing I want to talk about, and I just added this literally about uh, four o'clock today after I kind of got some, some summary stuff pushed out in terms of the producer payments. Um, we've been waiting for a long time. It's, it seems like a long time anyway to know um, how the direct payment provisions in the CARES Act would would be handled and distributed. And we have a little more clarification on that now. There'll, there'll be some more things come out, of course, in, in the next few weeks. But sign up is going to begin for the CPAP direct payments on March 26th. And that will occur at the local FSA office. So uh, middle of last week, USDA had a webinar. They did not release the details, but they just basically walked through some of the basic things. They, they did say that sign up would be through FSA, and they walked through some of those forms you have to have on file to actually participate. So any of you that already have this relationship with FSA probably have those forms on file, but if you don't, make sure you make contact and start getting that kind of stuff in place. Most are fairly simple, but, but they've got to be in place. Then there'll be a separate, um, CFAP application. So CFAP is an acronym, Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. This is what included the direct payments to producers. Just quickly walking through the details. Um, a little bit different than maybe what we've seen in the past. There's two pools of money here and um, the distinction can be a little bit confusing. In the final rule they refer to the CARES payment, okay, which is that's, that's the original legislation. And that payment is based on actual sales, okay, number of cattle sold from January 15th to April 15th. The second portion is the CCC, that's the Commodity Credit Corporation payment. And that's on unpriced cattle that were in inventory from April 16th to May 14th. So the way you wanna think about this is that the, the CARES payment is made on cattle that were actually sold during that January 15, April 15 period. And then anything that you had unpriced after that is eligible for the second CCC payment. One thing USDA did, just, just shooting from the hip here, they, they drew a line on the sand on April 15. And I'm gonna show you what I mean here right now. So these are the payment rates that were reduced. And these are, that, I'm sorry, that were, that were released. And these are all per head, but um, mature slaughter cattle. So think cull cows and slaughter bulls. That CARES rate for those sold is $92 a head. Um, not many slaughter cattle here, I'll kind of skip that one. Um, feeder cattle under 600 pounds, so thanks calves that were sold, 102 bucks a head. Um, larger, larger feeders above 600 pounds, 139 a head. And then there's an all other category, and it's where worded that anything that doesn't fall into any of the other categories. So I think I'm, I'm interpreting this largely for largely as breeding stock, cows and bulls. So that's the CARES portion, actual sales between mid-January and mid-April. The CCC component is much lower, okay? And this is for cattle that were in inventory and that were not sold during that time. And it's 33 bucks across the board. So when I say they drew a line in the sand, you know, there really is a big difference in cattle that were in terms of payment in cattle that were sold April 15 versus April 16, or cattle sold April 15 versus those that just simply weren't sold for whatever reason. So that line in the sand is definitely drawn there. Um, one more detail I'll share with you. The way they worded this was to avoid running out of money and I guess make sure funds were available. The payment rates that I'm showing you here and that were released, that's the full payment rate. However, initial payment will be 80% of that level. And then if funds are still available, they'll, they'll come back and make more payments up to that full amount that's listed there. So just be aware that the initial payment, the initial payment will be 80% of those numbers that you saw on the previous slide. 
Um, again, you, you'll do this through FSA. Sign up can begin on May 26th. USDA is using this website I'm showing you now as kind of a repository for all this information. It includes those forms that you need to have in place, a little bit more details about um, procedures and dates and even an office finder. But that's www.farmers.gov backslash CFAP. And that's the website where a lot of information is, is available, including the webinar from two weeks ago and the details from today. So anyway, um, like Dr. Renfro, I'm looking forward to talking with you and answering some questions. And I'm going to leave my content up for just a second, and then I will turn it over to Jeff. Thanks much. Thank you, Dr. Burdine. And um, Dr. Renfro, be sure to unmute yourself again. Great. It looks like you have. So as uh, questions start coming in, uh, one question that came in for uh, Dr. Renfro, um, question regarding do you have any update on the potential bottleneck on beef and pork as far as processing goes? And Kenny kind of mentioned this about backup in the processing. Um, any updates on that? Yeah, uh, I will say one thing. There are two things I've been seeing out there, and, and, and Dr. Berna and, and I kind of talked about this earlier uh, in the week as we were trying to kind of sync our talks together. Uh, those slaughter numbers are going up, but what we're seeing is carcass weights are going up as well. And that's because of that, that backlog or that bottleneck of, of uh, animals. One of the things I hate seeing is, uh, what we're now seeing is guidelines for euthanasia of pigs and chickens and poultry in general. Uh, I don't like that. I, you know, it seems odd for somebody that does this for a living, but, you know, you raise an animal a bit for food and it, and it's a, it's a shame that, you know, we have those bottlenecks, they happen. Uh, we've kind of become a victim of ourselves where we've selected these animals and we've improved management to where they can get to slaughter weight faster. And then something like this happens and it, it creates a bottleneck. Uh, the good thing is, is the other two industries, the pork and the poultry industry, they can recuperate faster than the beef industry can because of the time it gets, it takes an animal to, to harvest. But uh, even at that, you know, I read where there's a couple of turkey plants that say we've got enough backlog in the freezer. We're going to wade this out and shut the plants down and shutter them until this, this goes down. So. Right. So I don't know if we're going to see 15 cent, you know, turkeys for Thanksgiving or not. <laughs> right, right. Um, here's a question from uh, C.T. Trumbo uh, from Georgia. And uh, his question, Dr. Renfro, is uh, looking at some of the percentages that were in your presentations yeah. with regards to... Um, uh, consumers. Yeah. Consumers. Was that national? Were those... Kentucky percentages? Th those are national. It was an article that was published in, I get two updates a, a day from meetingplace.com and it was one of those within the last few days I read that article and I, you know, made, I had to go back and get it because our IT guy updated my computer for three hours a day. But uh, yeah, those were national numbers. Great. Dr. Burdine, um, Ben has a question in regards to um, the cap. Is the cap of $250,000 per person just for the CARES or is it CARES plus the CCC payment? So with the caveat that I, I read this, what are we talking about the first time this afternoon? Um, and, and, you know, some of this is interpretation on my part, but I, I definitely think that applies to both. So that's, that's total per total per individual in my opinion. And, and also uh, we'll go back to CT. He had a question with regards to more of a speculative question, but um, do you think that the, amount of money allocated is sufficient to help offset some of the losses that the producers are seeing uh, being the limit at night or the current funding at 19 billion. Yeah. So it, it offsets some, but it does not make folks whole. And truthfully, I don't know that that was ever the intention of USDA to make everyone whole. Um, you know, the, the payments that they estimated to the beef sector were 5.1. Well, were estimated $5.1 billion. You know, when, when the lost estimates were made by the committee chaired by Dr. Peel that I was involved with, we, we estimated total damages to the beef sector. Now, we were looking for 
full calendar year at about 13.6 billion. So no, they're not gonna make folks whole. Um, and particularly if you look at the payments from the CCC portion, so think about folks that are gonna be selling cabs this fall, then there, there's no question in my opinion that they'll be they'll have a bigger bigger loss than what that that ccc payment is going to be for those folks there's a, a question from um, alex uh, in anderson county and, and it's had a couple of producers mention they're worried about uh, imports of beef from brazil and and how large of a role will this potentially have on beef prices as we think about imports and then also in conjunction with that, I suppose, is the limitation on exports that Dr. Renfro mentioned as well. Is that a me question or a I think it's question? a market question. I think oh, it's a market one. <laughs> well, I'm going to answer it and then you feel free to jump in. Yeah, but, okay. But to Alex's question, um, in terms of market fundamentals, the, the imports from Brazil are, are small. So on a percentage basis, the impact on the market is small. So, you know, there's, you know, there's, Whenever you talk about imports in a time like this, it's always a heated issue, right? But the truth of the matter is, it's a very small share of our total beef supply. So the price impact fundamentally is small. And, and feel free to jump in, Dr. Renfro, as well. Yeah, it, what I've seen is some of the beef and you know that we import, it's really not going into a retail meat case. It's going into further processed items or even, you know, some of the, you know, maybe some of the Brazilian stuff are going into restaurants, but, uh, but yeah, you're not talking about a tremendous amount, like you're saying, Dr. Burdine. So. So just as a follow-up question along those lines, um, you know, we, we still remain to be a, a country that has a relatively large domestic consumption of our, our domestically produced beef. Um, approximately what percentage of domestic production do we consume? Um, Ooh, I don't know about that. Are, are we still up 90, 95%? I, I, yeah, I, yeah I, that sounds good. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I haven't seen those numbers in a while to know. Have you seen anything like that, Kenny? The question was what percent of our production in the U.S. do we consume here? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, we export, depending on the year, you know, 12 percent or so so i think you could make an argument that 88 percent of the beef we produce here is consumed here and of course there, there's some import as well very good was that the question yes yeah yeah jeff's vying to be an interviewer in the future when he retires so yeah but you guys have got to figure out how to redirect back to the appropriate question there you go <laughs> um just as a reminder um Tonight's uh, program will qualify for CAPE educational credits. And if you need to uh, do that, uh, we have put the CAPE code here. It's beef cats. And that would go on the CAPE educational form for the speaker name. Also, there's a link to a survey for this evening's program uh, that we'd appreciate all of you filling out uh, to have, provide some feedback on the programs. It's important to us to get your opinions on, on what we're doing here and, and uh, see how these are meeting uh, information and needs that you have. Uh, looks like Katie, uh, Dr. Van Valen has also put the link in the chat so you can copy that down. Uh, any other last questions for any of the speakers this evening? Dr. Burdine, would it be okay to sell cows now um, as right today or do you feel that maybe markets will go up if Wilm was to hold. I guess that's kind of trying to read into uh, CT's question there. Um, yeah, and, and did you mean to use the word cow, Jeff? You're talking about cold it, cows. Uh, it says cows. I'm assuming that means okay. cold cows. Yeah, so the truth is that the cold cow market is not that bad. It's actually one of the better spots in this market right now. Um, I, I'm not a huge proponent of, and he just answered to colds. Yeah, thank you, bud. Um, so... I've never been a big proponent of feeding cull cows just because I think the, you know, the cost of doing so oftentimes exceeds the value. But, you know, right now is a time when it probably makes some sense to utilize some pasture and do some of that. So, you know, if I've got cows that, you know, could use some condition that maybe have just weaned some calves and I could put some cheap gain on them via grass, I've got no issue with that. But it's not so much about, I think the market's going to get that much better. Seasonally, the peak is actually usually May or June. It's more about putting on inexpensive pounds on those cows. 
Good point. Uh, Dr. Renfro, if you're still with us, um, Eric has a question that I think would be appropriate for you and yep. to consider as the restaurants open. And, and you hit on this just a bit. Yeah. Um, as the restaurants begin to come online and food service uh, begins to increase in demand, how might that impact meat supply chain and potential prices uh, maybe that folks would see at the grocery store? Yeah, I, you know, this is total speculation, but, you know, as, as restaurants open back up, I, you know, especially here, you know, as, as, as Dr. Burdine pointed out, we're not doing this all at once. So, you know, we're seeing other states doing this as well as gradually opening up. Um, and I'm, I'm just speculating here. I would, I would think that we might see a little bit of a hiccup. Uh, mainly, I think uh, if we're going to go out to eat, we still celebrate with beef. And when we, we celebrate with beef, we celebrate with middle meats, you know, ribeyes, strip steaks, T-bones, filet mignons, things like that. So you could see a bit of a hiccup there. Um, I don't know about the ground beef, uh, but I, and I'm just speculating on this as, uh, as, as I said earlier, you could see a bit of a hiccup could cause the prices go up a little bit higher. I, I don't know, Dr. Bernard, have you seen anything like that, uh, in your research? No, and you know, part of things, yeah, I shoved that off to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, and of course, part of the issue is a lot of this price data is kind of delayed anyway, so yeah. I can't point anything right now. But, but no, the logic of what you said made perfect sense to me. Becky, uh, are you still on? Becky Thompson? I hate calling on somebody code like that. You'll have to unmute her, I think, Jeff. She can't unmute herself. Um, I'm trying to find her. Can you help me with that, Dare? She, she was playing Angry Birds when you. Uh, there she is. Exactly. Becky, are you on now? Yep. yep. I'm here. Fantastic, Becky. I've got a couple quick questions for you. Yep. Um, you know, you you've been working uh, tirelessly uh, and the the whole crew over there on the uh, uh, domestic, well, not domestic, the local beef product that's in Kroger's. Can you give us just an update on what the demand has been on, on that product? Because I've not sure. seen it in our store here locally. Uh, it seems like it's off the shelf every time I go in. Yeah, we've been doing our best to work with Kroger. Um, our Kroger's been ordering uh, double. They've doubled our orders the last three weeks. So we've been doing our best to supply them with the uh, Local Kentucky cows are, we're able to access the Kentucky cows through our farmers to be able to provide that market for them while also then, you know, sending it on to the stores. Um, we're also able to help the Kentucky food banks too with that money that Farm Bureau gave them. They've been able to access our product as well to, to utilize a local product through that avenue as well. And, and as a follow-up question that goes back to Dr. Renfro is have you found it a challenge to um, get the um, processing slots needed to process the cattle? We're very fortunate that we've been working with Mark's Ferry and they've been a great partner to us through all of this and have done their best to uh, work with our increased order to the best of their ability. Um, I know we were putting some pressure on them to do that, but they've been a great partner in supporting us through, you know, our increased demand and, and have been very willing to accommodate that. And, and if anybody wanted to uh, potentially look at that as a potential market uh, yes. for some other cattle, uh, who would be the contact person for um, the program? Sure. If they want to reach out to the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association, that phone number is 859-278. 0899 and ask for either myself or Caitlin Hawkins. We can get you the enrollment paperwork emailed out. Um, or you can email me at bthompson at kycattle.org. Thank you, Becky. And again, I apologize for calling on your code no like that. Um, any last questions for any of the speakers? I don't see anything in the chat. Just as a reminder, um, Dr. Bullock will send out the survey link as well to those that have registered with him um, and uh, you'll get that link in the email. 
I, I want to thank all of our speakers and also thank all of you for participating again uh, this evening. I hope everyone uh, finds a, a little bit of time to reflect on some positive things if you're dealing with some challenges, but uh, also realize that there are many people out there that uh, will be happy to help you if you need it. So uh, be sure to, to reach out. Everybody have a safe night and we look forward to seeing you uh, in the future. Thank you.